Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Bundle Place. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, Casey's Aboriginal communities and their rich culture, and pay respects to elders past, present and future. We acknowledge Aboriginal people as Australia's first peoples and as traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we work and live. My name is Sarah Lyons and I am the Education and Audience Engagement Officer here at Bundle Place Gallery. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion today in support of John's exhibition, Diaspora Psyche. Today we're joined by artists Nikki Lam, James Nguyen, John Young, and our panel moderator is Associate Professor Carolyn Barnes. Carolyn is Academic Director of Research Training at Swinburne Design, where she teaches research methods for design and researches co-design practices. In her spare time, Carolyn is an art fan, being widely published on subjects of Australian non-objective art and artist-initiated activity. And Craftsman House published her monograph on John Young in 2005. I'll now hand over to you, Carolyn, to introduce our panel. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so today um, we're here to really celebrate John's wonderful exhibition on the experience and phenomenon of diaspora, the, the historical and ongoing dispersal of people and cultures. We will discuss, I'm sure, um, some of the themes in the exhibition. Um, around identity and the experience of diaspora. But given the um, selection of panellists we've got today, I really wanted to approach this from the perspective that for artists who are alert to this, how one practises art, what media you work in and how, you, how your work reaches its audience represent a complex set of decisions. Um, this, I think, is um, multiplied when who you are crashes into assumptions about who is an artist and what is an art practice. And I think it's really clear that um, it's not about um, being in a studio slapping around paint so much anymore. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you, as the audience, a, uh, the audience a job. Um, as I introduce my panel, the panel members, so I'm going to introduce John first and then John's going to speak um, and then uh, it's going to be James and Nikki's turn. Um, I was going to edit down the profiles that were um, provided on the back of the sheet by the audience, but when I read them I thought, mm, these are super interesting in terms of um, how they um, define the breadth and diversity of an art practice, how it's expanded, um, and also the way that um, contemporary artists are positioned today. So your task is, as I'm reading out these, uh, these intros, to think about, like, what is this saying about the contemporary role or the role of the contemporary artist? So John is going first. Now, he's had a long career, so he's dropped off some of the stuff that he does, has done and continues to do around advocacy for um, uh, Australian Asian art. Um, but um, to introduce John, the values in Young's work, a keen sense of form, a brave synthesis of content, a consideration of technology, its relationship to effect, affection and the melancholy inherent in the diasporic spirit find their roots in his bicultural experience. Born of southern Chinese parentage in the then British colony of Hong Kong, Young moved to Australia in 1967 as a young child, which was an amazing experience, I'm sure. Um, equally engaged by theoretical concerns and the pleasure of painting, he read philosophy and science of science and aesthetics at the University of Sydney. His investigation of Western modernism prompted significant phases of work from a bicultural viewpoint. His evolving concerns with the discourses of the time, including postmodernism and postcolonialism, and the ongoing tensions surrounding globalization, have contributed to intriguing cycles of works. Young's intellectual rigor, combined with a fundamental commitment to painting, painting, make him one of the most fascinating and respected artists in Australia today. So, John, would you like to uh, make an opening statement? Um, thank you very much, Carolyn. It's, well, 
I'll try to live up to uh, the sort of superlatives, I must say. Uh, uh, um, and thank you all for, for coming uh, today. I think it's, it's quite an um, open sort of discussion today that we're going to have. And uh, that description uh, was probably uh, interesting in a sense that I agree with you. There's, there's, there's a lot of different junctures in uh, the several decades that I've been working in. Um, you know, going from this sort of late 70s in, in terms of uh, your American late modernism, where modernism is sort of defined as relatively autonomously within uh, as an autonomous practice between uh, the artist and the object, um, you know, sort of quite, in a sense, quite independent from the, the social conditions around it, uh, with theorists like Clement Greenberg and people like that, uh, to the time when I guess I really, really, in a sense, entered it out, well, we'll just postmodernism, where uh, in the sort of 80s and the 90s, where the, uh, uh, the meaning of an art object uh, sort of became a sort of uh, open-ended, sort of not specific sort of um, condition for the art object uh, to be read. Um, to a time in the sort of like late 90s and early uh, 2000s of uh, what is now called uh, relational art or relational aesthetics or sometimes uh, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, the antithesis of that as well, which is sort of like, uh, you know, resistance and uh, re resistance relations. Um, where the artist is seen not so much like in the early modernist days or even in postmodernist days where the artist is actually this producer of things, they're more like a catalyst. And uh, within uh, a gamut of uh, practices and any sort of aspect in life, any sort of practice in life is considered as part of the artwork. Now, um, it's interesting in the sense that these three different phases uh, that I've, I've sort of, in a sense, had to uh, work with, uh, particularly as an artist from uh, diaspora, uh, is really every time we have to renegotiate our situation within that, those three different phases. And uh, how you, do you negotiate with that? Well, you've got to really uh, go back to one's own heritage and, and one's own sense of values and how that measures up, first of all. And then secondly, then you've got to see whether the, the dominant hegemon, uh, which is either whether it's modernism, postmodernism, or, or uh, uh, relational aesthetics, those dominant uh, sort of paradigms of art uh, allows you to, to work within it as well because of the different values that you hold. And, uh, and I feel that this is a very important crux for the diaspora and artists to think about, uh, particularly in terms of the forms you use, uh, as we were talking about today. And, and so in that sense, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant sense of negotiation. Uh, it's a constant sense of negotiation of where the artist uh, herself or himself is in relationship to to the work, whether you're a catalyst or whether you're actually a producer, um, and 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 if and also also a decision as to whether you sign up to to the dominant hegemon. If you sign up to it, and give up some of your values, uh, you you may be put in a very privileged position, uh, but then you're doing it in a way sort of quite uh, not so much hypocritically, but you know you would lose a lot of your own sense of meaning in, in the way how you do things. So I guess this is how I'd like to introduce the, the position. Thanks, John. Um, hopefully we can have a really good discussion about how this all plays out for artists of different generations, because you've sort of seen it all, haven't you, John? But to see where <laughs> <laughs> that, um, yeah, how that complexity is read by, um, by James and by Nikki. 
Um, so Nikki and James are going to show you some of their work, just briefly, and James is going to go first. So um, Dr James Nguyen is currently a Gertrude Street studio artist. In his practice, he works with short-form documentaries, sculptor, sculpture and experimental collaborations. Together with friends, colleagues and family, James creates conversations around epistemic refusal, the diasporic absurd and risk. Nguyen is, has a Bachelor of Fine Arts Honours from the National Arts School, a Master of Fine Arts at the Sydney College of the Arts, University of Sydney, and a PhD from the University of New South Wales. He has taught experimental drawing at the National Arts School, film anthropology at University of New South Wales, and sculpture at the Victorian College of the Arts, Melbourne University. With support from the Anne and Gordon Samstug Scholarship, Nguyen was a collaborative fellow at Union Doc Centre for Contemporary Documentary Arts in New York City. Most recently, James has received support from the Australian Council of the, for the Arts and Arts NSW for the Bleed Festival and Dream Sequence with um, Urban Theatre Projects, which is really an, a, a good description of a complex, very, very busy, expanded practice. So, James, over to you. So, some would say it's opportunistic, but... Um... <laughs> Yeah, so uh, for, for me, um, before I start, I'd like to say the acknowledgement of country in Vietnamese, my mother tongue. Tôi xin cảm ơn người bún bún rung ở vội bún rung ở đất Iskulin, đất nước của tổ tiên của người ấy, đất nước bị người khác lấy đi mà không bao giờ nhường. Chúng tôi cảm ơn hôm nay được làm việc hôm nay ở chỗ đất đấy. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm going to turn, I think it's this, I'll play you a video. Yeah, so this was a project um, for the Bleed Festival that my friend um, Victoria Fan fall through the air against and the I surface of the ocean. presented last year during COVID. Um, it was meant to be a live collaborative project about a drum from the Vietnamese culture, um, but it turned out into this kind of like filmic work. Hands break open a dragon fruit. Soon after their union, Olga bore a sack of 100 eggs that hatched into 100 beautiful children. They grew up strong and courageous like their father and kind and skillful like their mother. A banana leaf is cut. Blurry footage of a man holding a writhing snake. He lifts it in the air and smiles as its tail curves up towards his face and wraps around his arm. Close up of the snake's scales. They made a promise that despite their distance, they would always protect each other. So in the mountainous areas of northern Vietnam, Olga raised her children to become the fearless Hong Vuong kings. She taught them to breed animals and cultivate the soil, to grow fruit trees and harvest mulberry bushes. Along the coastline, Lạc Long Guan taught his children to govern his kingdom, teaching them the skills of fishing, ocean faring, and the art of tattoos to scare off monsters as they dive and hunted for food. These tribes became the ancestors to the Vietnamese people. of faded colour photos of landscape being bombed is shown in sequence. Clouds of dark smoke rise from explosions in the distance, seen through trees in the foreground. Views across forest and fields. A mushroom cloud on the horizon. A view from behind someone's head and shoulders. They wear a khaki shirt and headgear. Fallen trees. Puffs of grey and white smoke at ground level in the middle distance. Billows of smoke rising upwards. The photographs mildewed and blotchy in places. 
smoke haze spreads over the valley. Yeah, this next Mom, work, um, I worked with my auntie. Từ nhớ nhà, nhưng không chỉ có nhớ nhà. Theo tôi, nó là bệnh. Luôn luôn mang theo trong thể xác và tinh thần. Yeah, so the war memorial um, gave me some money to make some work. And so I've been working around um, how Agent Orange was produced in Sydney on the Parramatta River. And this was, I guess, uh, to be used during the Vietnam War, which destroyed a third of its forests. Um, and Khu vực này ẩm như quê tôi. Chắc vì vậy nên họ đã chọn để thử thuốc khai hoang. Yeah, and um, Australia didn't only produce Agent Orange and um, the dioxin, the chemicals that um, came with it. It also tested these chemical agents in uh, Mamu land, in, around Cairns in northern Queensland, um, because the weather and the monsoon climate there is very similar to Vietnam. And so when my auntie and I went up to this land, it reminded her of home. Yeah, that's about five minutes. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, uh, we, with me, I, I do a lot of work with um, my family and my friends to explore different ideas. And the form that we use it, it's, I call it conversational, and it doesn't really matter what comes out of it. It could be cinematic. Um, the photographs that you saw were actually um, Fung's collection. Um, one of the collaborators of Nikki, um, from the diaspora beer now, which is amazing, which you should all go to. Yeah, oh, hyphenated. <laughs> Sorry, I tried promo, but I'm terrible. <laughs> yeah, now, now you'll remember it, right? Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's that thing where you draw on your resources of friendship um, to kind of like produce the work that you need to produce. And, and you know, it's situational. We were making this video and we needed footage and we needed like photographs and the resources around you, like your friends and, and your community of artists. They're, they're the ones that you always can um, rely on to help you express your ideas. Thanks, James. Okay, so um, Nikki's also going to show some of her work. So Nikki Lam is an artist, curator and producer now, remember, you're meant to be thinking about what this means, the way that she's positioned. Okay. Uh, and producer based in Nam. Working primarily with moving images, her work explores hybridity and memory through the contemplation of time, space and impermanence. Born in Hong Kong, her work deals with the complexity of mig migratory expressions within and beyond the concept of diaspora. Nikki's current research focuses on the artistic agency during cultural, social and political transitions, particularly within the context of moving images and screen cultures, drawing on the tensions and misalignments between histories and cinematic imageries, colonial gaze and the migrant body. She is interested in negotiating and speculating truths through translation, fragmentation and regeneration. With an expanded practice in writing, exhibition and festival making, she is interested in exploring the anti-colonial methods in art making and curatorial practice, as well as relational and community practices. Nikki is currently co-director of Hyphenated Projects and Hyphenated B 
Biennial and curator at large at the substation. She has been the artistic director of Channel's Video Art, Fest Art Festival alongside many hybrid roles in the arts, including ACMI, Next Wave and Footscray Community Arts Centre. And on top of all of that, Nikki is currently a PhD candidate at RMIT University. <laughs> so over to you, Nikki. Thank you. Um, sorry, that was way too long. <laughs> um, like James, I'm also um, a bit of a hustler. That's why I do so many things. Um, I thought maybe I'll start with just showing you some of my own um, video works. It's not very long. Um, I've got a few works here and it actually starts um, with the most recent one, so it might not be like chronological, <laughs> um, so bear with me. Um, this first work um, called The Unshakable Destiny, um, and it's actually um, coming from a quote um, during the Hong Kong handover ceremony when the last governor of Hong Kong, Chris Patton, gave a speech about um, Hong Kong's future as um, being um, sort of a promise to the Hong Kong people and um, it's the unshakable destiny. Um, and uh, obviously this work is, it was made early in the year and it's first part of a trilogy. Um, it's the first kind of more cinematic work that I've made. Um, as, as I said before, it's not chronological in this show reel, so it's a bit like, um, this is the most recent work. <laughs> anyway, I'll sh just play that. So a lot of my work is, um, I'm really interested in sort of like the Im immateriality of um, memory and um, and how sort of as a migrant myself, how I've remembered um, my home um, and my family and my connections and, and whatnot. And um, I think uh, for The Unshakable Destiny, it, it, it's quite an elaborate um, filmic work. Um, and. The intention for that work was to kind of reference a lot of the iconic Hong Kong cinematic um, imagery um, that are quite often being referenced um, all around the world, you know, aesthetics of Wong Kar Wai and cyberpunk, um, that sort of thing. Um, and using that first um, film as sort of like a, an anchor point for um, the rest of the trilogy, which still in the making. Um, so now this is the last work that I've made, which I actually made in Taiwan on a residency at Pier 2 Art Centre in Kaohsiung. Um, it's called Anchor and a Loose Thread. Um, I collaborated with um, two local dancers um, on this particular work um, through sort of processes of translations and um, also conversations around um, memory. Um, we sort of worked on some of the iconic sites that the dancers felt really connected to um, 
in and around Kaohsiung. Um, and we um, filmed them in terms of like a performance of how they've remembered that place or particular memory from the past. Um, it's supposed to be a two channel video work, but um, I've kind of, this is like a single channel version of it. This next work is quite um, personal and it's kind of closer to what um, previously my practice has been, which was a lot more performative for, my, for myself. Um, this was like the first work that I've actually incorporated my family into it. Um, and um, there's a lot, I think that was 2018 was around the time when I started to think about um, what's my relationship um, with uh, sort of my, my past, my stories, and like this resistance of not um, telling my story or, or talking a lot about my identity in my own work. Um, and this was kind of a bit of a uh, shifting point for me. was another work that I made in 2017 um, called Still um, What Is Left and it was very much, I think I might just stop there and just talk about that a little bit. Um, it was very much about um, sort of uh, abstracting gestures um, through memory um, and so, sort of looking at some of the gestures that I was really familiar with from childhood um, through um, ceremonial um, rituals with families and whatnot and then abstracted them into um, gestures and I guess um, exploring this idea of how they are gestures that live in my own body. Um, yeah, so that's kind of more or less what I would like to show in terms of moving image works. Um, but I suppose um, a lot of my practices and, and I think we can unpack that a little bit later as well. Um, it's also kind of in this kind of artist, curator, producer space. Um, um, as James was mentioning, I, I collaborate with um, an incredible artist, um, Fung Ngo, and um, we um, run Hyphenated Projects together, which is predominantly a, um, a platform and a curatorial collective that, um, that um, works with Asian Australian artists. Um, but it's even with that, it's, it's sort of constantly morphing and expanding um, the work that we do. Um, so it's like through that practice, um, how we like how I position myself as a as an artist, curator, producers constantly kind of informing each other as a as a practice. That's me. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so to start off the discussion, um, it seems to me that for each of you, storytelling linked to location, ancestry, and cultural ties underpins your practice, but each of you approach um, this in really different ways. I wonder if maybe, um, starting with John, you'd like to talk about the way that form and content intersects in your work, because 
particularly for you... No, no, I'm not going to say particularly. For all of you, in a lot of ways, the, the form is the content. And, yeah, John, would you like to start with that one? I guess we're talking about the re in reference to the show next door. Yeah, yeah um, just just to carry on from uh, what Nikki and James uh, are dealing with, uh, of course, uh, the ground level for diaspora artists is obviously a question of memory because because memory is the reality uh, which we we carry everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, that that is the. The, the, the reality that one has. And so in that sense, uh, I guess it was a very important determinant in terms of the formal construction of the work that I do. However, the form of the work in the exhibition, for example, the history projects, um, because I, I am from a, sort of like a late modernist tradition, uh, was really uh, based on installation form and the grid, which was obviously, you know, like Lowit and, and, and people like that, uh, you know, very, Anna Dubov and people like that, uh, utilized the grid as a, a system of equivalence. But I've used this as a system uh, of equivalence for not so much a storytelling, but really embedding a, a, a fragmented narrative. Uh, as as a memory source, and then when I say memory, I don't mean an artist trying to tell the audience uh, about a particular uh, situation or or narrative. And in which case, like safety zone, is a question of benevolence in relationship to the narrative and different values associated with it. It's not really so much that. It's 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 really about a um, uh, a reciprocal relationship between myself and whilst I'm making that work, I'm actually learning all these different values uh, that was embedded in the reimagining of the the actual uh, narrative, you know, uh, whether it's from uh, wherever it is from, but it's from the past. It's, it's a reimagining which I, I try to, to, to actually learn from. Uh, and I think that the system, the formal system of using this late modernist way of working, but also with a consciousness, a filmic consciousness as well, because I think that, um, you know, the unfolding in a large installation in terms of time and in the way how you see things in this multifarious way uh, is also relatively filmic. You know, it's not, not like as if you're looking at something uh, which is sort of within a frame or 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 outside just outside of the frame it's 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 much more of a i guess a lot more formally a lot more uh, visceral experience um with the chalk marks and and the images uh that evoke um you know sort of certain points of memory so so in that sense i think that the form is really something that i've derived uh of, is from late modernism but I still probably have some faith in the sense that using these late modernist forms is a sort of a trust in the fact that there is a sort of a possibility of maturation in our visuality. I, I still believe that within popularizing everything uh, and the way how people are just looking at art as if it was a visual image, we have the danger that we get down to a very, very primitive level of visuality rather than, you know, all the sophisticated form of visuality that late modernism has developed, particularly in Europe and America, you know. Uh, but now that it's, it's an expanded field globally, um, I still have that, that sense that there, there needs to be a sort of sophistication held within the formal construction of work. But, I mean, all three of you, um, layering of meaning and referentiality, uh, they're there, like the works suffuse with that. Whereas for you, John, I mean, you've got these, you know, you talk about a, a system. Um, the works, to an extent, are very complex with these layers. There's um, lots and lots of layers going on, lots of things for the... Um, 
audience to piece together and to think about. When I look at James and Nikki's work, all of that's happening, but you've got this whole the the fluidity of duration of the the video. So it's a different experience in the the delivery system. So Nikki and James, would you like to talk to maybe your choice of your choice of video? Don't fight over it. <laughs> <laughs> I won't give you a choice next time. I'll just go. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually really like what John just said about um, memory as a form because I, I've never thought of it that way, but I actually think that that is sort of what I work with as well. And um, when you think about memory, it has so many different, um, you know, you, there's so many different access points to it. Like you could kind of... Um, think about it as image, you could think about it as time. And um, I guess a lot of my, in my artistic practice, I'm really interested in um, how to manipulate that um, that, that uh, time um, in, in, in reference to memory. Sometimes it's collapse. And, and I mean, I see that in, in your work, John, um, you know, like your work's always like, so um, you, you see the collapsing of time um, in your, in, in the object, in the material. And I, I think that for me, like video and sound um, definitely have that ability to sort of um, expand in a non-narrative way, but still kind of hold some sort of linear um, lin lineage of, of memory, I guess. Yeah. What about you, James? Yeah, like I, I totally agree with that. And, and I, I also think that memory is also knowledge, you know, like we we assume that because, you know, like memory is something that's in each individual's head and it's not, you know, inscribed un unless it's some sort of autobiography, then it's almost worthless or, you know, not, not part of the, the canon. Um, yeah, but, but kind of like the, the memories that we carry and the relationships that we carry with each other as we're making and as we're thinking, it's kind of this unheld, ungraspable thing that you know, you're, you're part of, and then you eventually will lose your memory. And and it's something that gets passed on. And, and it's that, that knowledge, you know, like seeing a Cezanne, for example, like the, the fracturing of, of, of the surface allows multiple entry points. The, that, that also makes us, you know, diasporic artists part of that. You know, like we, as diasporic artists speak multiple languages. We speak the language of the Western canon. We speak the language of our mother's stories. We speak the language of racism that we've encountered. We also speak the language of, you know, like our resistance to those forms of oppression that you kind of encounter every day. And so memory and language becomes this thing that we're able to speak in multiple dimensions, multiple forms. And I think um, content and subject separated from form is kind of like a weird Western construct. Um, it's something that you just do. Like it's, it's implicit in everything that you do. Like you, you live it. But... Um it's interesting that, I mean, John, you started, you were a, an art student in the time when painting was dead, declared to be dead, and everything fragmented and the content of art was the critique of art and the institutions and trying to disrupt the gallery system, the art world system. But, in fact, you came back. I mean, I know that um, in your early work, even though you were working through minimalist and conceptualist practices, there was a really strong exploration of identity in there. I can remember your work where you're, you know, trudging back and forth through the snow in China, which, you know, looks like a, a piece of land art or, you know, something like that, but, in fact, has this really strong personal resonance to it. But you came back to painting and you've stuck with painting. But for um, James and Nikki, I wonder, um, you know, did you ever... I mean, you, did you start with video? Was that the choice? No. I, I went to the National Art School. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone knows from Sydney, it's pretty much the atelier model of um, art making. 
and yeah, so so basically it held kind of like that Western model of, you know, having a studio, drawing, painting as kind of like a model of thinking. And and I think it, we, within that it, it gave me like a really good grounding and understanding of like Western art. And and I think John uses that as well because, you know, when when you're an artist and when, when you start as an artist, you kind of want to be part of something. And part of something is the Western canon. You know, like we speak English, we we watch, you know, film that's constructed through like this whole history that's that's related to, to kind of that canon. We all want to feel privileged. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we, we, we want to kind of like win at life. And to win at life, you have to speak that mode. You have to speak the canon of Western art and knowledge. And, and so, yep, we've, we all participate in it, we've all graduated in it, we've got all our certificates. And, and once you learn to speak that, you kind of realise, oh, oops, you've missed out on other things. And you, you start to kind of like rebuild that and regain other forms of knowledge. And usually it's through kind of like your relationships. I think it's a it's a it's a very interesting point in the sense that there's almost like more of a um, entropy for, for us to want to belong to that because you 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 get the privilege which you haven't been given. You know, like in the sense that you know there there's no sense of uh, uh, you know nobody's actually ever ever said to you that we are allowed in 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 through this door. Or through this gate, you know, and 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 once you subscribe to it, wow! All of a sudden, I'm an artist. I I'm doing all this modernist stuff, you know, like I'm privileged, and I think that um, this is this is not just an issue for diaspora and artists. It's also an issue for a lot of young artists in Australia as well. That it is so easy to feel sort of somehow privileged if you're within the the art confines, you know. But but then all of a sudden, there's this niggling thing of being a diaspora and artist. You've got all these other values that you. So you need to somehow describe or, or develop or make clear in this society and you can't do it through... Also exploit. Exploit, yeah. Yeah, well, precisely, or, 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 or uh, exoticise, yeah. So I'm super fascinated now because I would have thought that by the time... I mean, you saw the demise of modernism, you were there... Yes, we were there for that and saw it all fall apart and all this really interesting, you know, performance art, video, you know, heaps of junk in the gallery as art, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I would have... So for you two, was Western art was not a moribund, like, burnt-out practice? Or this is really interesting because I would have thought, like... <laughs> Thanks, James. That... And plus, you know, the the cultural background, the cultural leg legacy that you bring to your practice is thousands of years old and is, you know, super intellectual and spiritual and amazing, yet such is the claim um, of the westernised art world, you are American art, that you actually felt this is something to join or th there's no escaping it. Nikki... I don't think I knew any of that <laughs> <laughs> when I went to art school. <laughs> um, but also, um, I was an international student, so I think that was a very different experience um, navigating art school as well as being an international student at the time, and that was like um, around like 2007, 2009. Um, and I guess art schools have changed quite a lot yeah. um, now um, as it's I'm also in one at the moment, but it's, I think, um, yeah, I don't think I actually knew what I was getting myself into. And, and it took a very, very long time and probably I, I would say not until maybe the last four or five years that I've realised, oh, actually, I don't need to subscribe <laughs> to... Um, anything that doesn't feel right to me. And and I guess that is sort of a, um, you know, coming of age or it's a um, it's finding your own voice within your practice and, and negotiating all of that systemic um, issues um, that you find yourself in while kind of working out um, what your voice actually is. And for me, I think um, that's where my curatorial and writing kind of comes in. 
um, I'm, I'm not a writer and I'm kind of not really a curator curator either because I don't um, necessarily see my um, curatorial practice through the lens of art history, um, but I um, curate um, relationally, I suppose, that I, I'm really interested in, um, like my medium is moving image and video art and I'm really interested in the medium and the form and time-based practices and how those... Um, you know, those qualities kind of transcend between um, sort of the physical space and the screen space. Um, and I think that it is within that that I've found my language and my voice, which is actually not quite in art history either. It's sort of um, somewhere between sort of cinema, media, art, um, and, and, you know, as soon as you get into sort of cinema and media art, you, you tap into like this whole different, very, like, um, international and diverse um, sort of realm that, that is not necessarily confined by what, I guess, institutional, um, you know, ways of looking at art history might be, yeah. So when you are actually uh, curating, do you see then, if that's the case, that you're actually accumulating a sort of cultural capital of uh, sort of people that are sort of have this resistance towards the, the dominant sort of like context in, in um uh i suppose yeah i'm not sh i'm not sure if if you mean do you mean like what do you mean by that <laughs> well i mean in the sense that if 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 the dominant sort of institutions are not showing this sort of work and you're curating it to 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 actually you know uh make it public so to speak then you are sort of in a way gathering a lot of cultural uh, capital in doing that. Uh, you've got, in regard to whoever the artist is and whoever the curators are, there, there's going to be a, a accumulation of that. So it's yeah. in a sense, in that way, it is uh, political. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I would like to think that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but I think it's... it's um, I think I kind of got into curating for that reason. It, w it was because um, after art school, um, uh, it was like around 2009, and, and at the time there was just, n I was just getting rejection after rejection, like no one seemed to <laughs> want me to show anywhere. And so I kind of just thought, well, I'm not gonna wait and s wait until someone would let me in, like I'm just going to make my own way. Um, and I think it was through those kind of little, like, small shows and then getting kind of friends together, um, that's when I realised, yeah. actually, you could make it. Your yeah, own. it's just that it, then you're entering into a realm which in modernist days artists never had to, which is power and ethics. You know, like, once you're, you're dealing with the, the notion of sort of political context within the institutions, you, you're entering into a sort of, like, a real... Um, domain where power is negotiated and also uh, your ethical decisions is actually crucial. James, would you like to comment on that your entry into the art world and those sorts of decisions? Yeah, like it's it's a hustle, right? Like, yeah, and, hustle. and you just got to be able to fail. And, and, and I think... We are very lucky in, you know, like whatever privileges that we have in, in you know, like having friends around and just setting up shows and, and stuff. But in, in a way that that freedom is extraordinarily dangerous. You know, like it's dangerous for institutions that, that hold a certain establishment of power that, that, you know, John was referring to. And for Hyphenated, for example, you know, like they're doing things that the institutions have wet dreams about, but because they don't have the kind of like cultural sophistication and also kind of like the flexibility and openness to do that, they can't do that. And so you're, you're able to attract, you know, like funding, you're, you're actually institutions are scrambling to work with you, right? And, and it's because, you know, like you're working from a place that means something to you, you know, that, that's not empty and it's not built upon some kind of like infrastructure of, you know, like privilege or, or history or whatever, right? Like it's, it's that establishment fear of 
of us, like it's an establishment fear of us being so dangerous because not only are we able to speak their language, we're able to deploy that language against them and we're, <laughs> more importantly, we're able to deploy that language to have conversations between each other and to create something for ourselves and not be completely and utterly dependent on the institutions for, what, what, what's the word for? A, um, access, access to an, audi or yeah. an audience yeah. because we, we, platform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we don't need that sometimes. Like it's good to get that support, but it's not essential in how we practice. So, I mean, I think that issue of access is an interesting one because, I mean, just to get myself in the mood for, for this talk, I was just able to go onto the internet and you know, look at your showreels and you know experience your work. Like you've got such incredible access. Um, I mean, I know, like you know, when you talk about side hustles, and I can see the way you construct your career. There's so many different things you're doing. I mean, it must be incredibly exhausting to do all of those things. And of course. Um, you know the the challenge must be to not let that dissipate the focus on your 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 art practice. That must be really challenging. But John, you you sort of persist with the um, you know, with the ga with the gallery, don't you? I'm really and old painting. School. I'm really <laughs> old school like that only because I hang on to some sort of like positivistic idea that somehow visuality needs to be. Um, you know, uh, needs not so much progress, but needs to be, you know, become more sophisticated because I see society's sense of visuality going downhill, downhill, downhill uh, by the day. You know, most people are pretty blind in terms of, you know, like going about doing things and looking at things. And that, that concerns me. Uh, but on the other hand, I also see that there is a absolutely there's this political imperative and this uh, imperative to actually uh, put your own position out there, you know, or or, or or a more multicultural position or whatever it is that uh, that the dominant hegemon doesn't actually, you know, allow. That there is definitely this this issue there as well. So, so I'm sort of. Um, feel that it's, 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 a, it's a constant fine negotiation between uh, the sense that you need to maturate the visual culture, but at the same time have a lot of ethical and political uh, input into it. Yeah, I mean, I think we sort of live in a um, two-speed cultural economy at the, you know, at the moment. I mean, I, I want both things. I want the ability to access both things. Like I want to be in a museum or a gallery and have this you know, really resonant space to focus on someone who's done something, you know, incredibly considered. But I also want to see that very considered work, you know, when I want to see it and just start looking at videos. I mean, both of those things are really fantastic. Um, I suppose, um, you know, when you think about, um, you know, I mean, in, in this day and age, like we're at a time when you know, you sort of think that nobody's on the margins. I mean, it's a very Pollyanna, you know, sort of position to take. And, you know, I mean, a lot of good things, things are moving in the right direction. So, I mean, a good example would be um, obviously the issue of women's access to equality of opportunity and a focus on the sorts of issues that women want to talk about. That's not resolved, but it's much, much better than it is. But I'm really interested in thinking about, in you talking about how um, as artists who represent um, Asian cultures, you know, do you really feel that's still a problematic place to speak from or practice from in Australia? Because the work, I mean, the work's so rich. Like, the the work is just fantastic. So, um, you still feel that, Nikki? Go on. I think, well, I don't know if problematic is the word. It's very complicated. Like, it's very complicated because we all come from such different experiences and different lives and completely different um, subjectivities. And I We're guess... different the, Asians. Yeah, different yeah. Asians. Um, you know, and, and it's it's... It's very complicated. Like, I mean, I think 
you know, obviously you could only ever, um, you know, represent yourself and then um, encourage others to support each other, right? Like you could, there's a lot of work that, that can be done in terms of um, platforming others and, and supporting each other and elevating everyone, you know, at the same time like addressing a lot of those issues, like political issues um, in an ethical way. But um, I also think that we need to look outside of our own sort of identities as well. You know, we are we are all living and practising on stolen land, like, you know, and, and there's incredibly, like, complex um, sort of... Uh, uh, like positioning in terms of how we talk about our own stories as well. And I think that that probably came back to like what I was saying earlier, that I've always felt a little bit uneasy um, talking about my um, identity in a way, because it almost feels like there's an economy now where we trade um, identity and stories and traumas um, to you know, to gain something from it. And, and you know, I'm not saying that don't share, like people can share, you know, whatever they feel comfortable in, but I think it's, again, it's the institutions kind of going, oh, um, well, that's an incredible story. We have to put it at the back room in the, and give them platform. And, and then it's, again, kind of giving that power back to the institutions to then kind of, um, uh, you know, Put you in a box and I, and I think that the resistance for me myself it comes in sort of negotiating when do I share and who do I share it with and how and and the language that I use would be different in different settings um and um yeah so I think in terms of representing others I think it's like it's quite it's quite complex I think even with the work that we do at hyphenated projects it's very clear that it's it's a it's a curatorial project and it's um, that we are only kind of, uh, you know, curating thematically um, and they're not quite, oh, this is, this is what the Asians are doing right now. It's more <laughs> like these are some of the themes that we are all really interested in right now and that, let's have a dialogue with each other. Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, there's, there's a fundamental difference even in terms of um, government institutions, the difference between seeing multiculturalism as decorative or is it actually a core value that is actually being practiced. I think this is absolutely crucial because if it is decorative, then it's just exploited by art institutions, whatever, as just yet another way of, you know, bringing the spectacle further. Yeah, like I, I think it's really important to feel uncomfortable, you know, like, and, and to be in situations that are uncomfortable because you really have to self-analyze and be really self-critical and think about every move that you do because you know you're afraid and and i think that that gives a certain kind of strength and clarity to kind of like the work or anything that you do in your life right and so you know w once again you know like that that negotiating that problematic space of you know being squatters and colonizers on aboriginal land like if if mainstream culture decided that it was uncomfortable with itself and if it was able to kind of like see, you know, like these Asians being comfortable and doing fine, maybe it's okay for mainstream culture to be uncomfortable and to reflect and to kind of like take kind of like affirmative or like real action to kind of like make change because, you know, like mainstream culture has so much power and if it can, utilize that power in, in kind of like a self-reflexive and and clear and nuanced and thinking way that everyone like us here here on stage ha has to navigate you know women whatever like Asians whatever like yeah like from that positionality of otherness is kind of like a really powerful situation to be in and if Australia can see itself as as weak as other as you know like not being at the center of everything like it can make really powerful interventions in the world climate change for example you know so that was actually going to be my last prompt exactly what you said then but um you know the 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 experience of diaspora you know just really shows everyone that identity experience aren't stable or fixed 
that they can just, you know, unfold and, you know, morph all over the place, you know, over the course of a lifetime and also due to, due to circumstance. So do you think this is a message that Australia's uh, generally is open to hearing about? Because, I mean, John, you've been at this a very long time of, you know, explaining this you know, the challenges of shifting around the world and having to sort of reposition and reinvent yourself. Over your career, do you think that there's more of an openness to this message? Mm. I think that openness is, is slowly happening within the most avant-garde cultural area. Uh, I, I don't think that it's necessarily... Uh, there in the reassessment of Australia's uh, visual history or uh, art history, in a sense, I think that it, it's still primarily Anglo, you know, based sort of uh, history. But but in fact, actually, in fact, for example, attempts at um, negotiating multiculturalism was there for a very long time with people like Margaret Preston and and and, and Tom Roberts and people like that. It's just that people never saw it that way and it's never been reinterpreted that way so in that in that sense i mean just my little contribution to this answer i mean you know james and nikki might have different ways of seeing it but uh is that um no i think that you know there is still a sort of a closure uh in, within the institutions f for this uh as its core value uh, but not really, uh, it's being entertained in a sense, if, if anything, you know, I feel, uh, uh, with some of the major symbolic institutions in Australia, um, but not necessarily, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that the question, there's a lot of questions regarding friendship and hospitality coming out, and I think that that's a good thing, um, but I, I think that, you know, you've got to, dovetail that with questions of friendship and location too, you know, like, so, I don't know. But you're, I mean, you are holding up a mirror to, a mirror that diaspora is part of everybody's experience. Either it's your personal experience or it's come into your life because somebody else has had that, that experience. And I mean, it's just completely undeniable now. So, I don't know, are you more hopeful that Nikki and... James, that this is, I mean, I would think that you're on the, you know, you're well positioned in history because you've got, you've found these strategies to get your message out. And as you're saying, you know, you've bypassed the art world in a way. You're part of the art world, but you've also found these, you know, ways to negotiate other avenues of accessing an audience. Are you hopeful that, that this message, I mean, because to me, it's a gift to Australia. Like, you're working through all of this, and I mean, any place in the world, but I mean, you know, you're w actively working through this in your practice and the really, um, you know, the way you think about the, the politics of what you do, every aspect of it. I mean, just reading your biographies and all the things you do, um, it's sort of a level of um, engagement and work that often artists have not had to do before. I mean, I'm sure they've thought about these sorts of things, but just the demand. Um, you know, are you more hopeful that this is starting to bear fruit? Are you hopeful? Yeah. <laughs> James, do you want to go first? <laughs> well, my first comment is that I'm not here to solve your problems. <laughs> you no, that's why I said a gift. It was <laughs> yeah, a yeah. gift. Yeah, yeah and, and it's that thing where John said you're only a part of something. You know, and to be a part of something is actually really special and privilege. You know, like we're given so many privileges to be here, you know, like and, and to make, you know, and, and it's exhausting and it's awful and it's tiresome, yada yada. But it's a real privilege because what I see is that Australia is waking up to itself. You know, like people are feeling like the effects of climate change, of fires and crazy storms that you can't tell what's going on. You know, like and, and, Australia, and certain parts of Australia finally recognising that freedom is important. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, if they haven't got that, the privilege that we've got, that we've actually worked really hard for and we've fought really hard for, sometimes that, that recognition of fracture 
and discomfort is really challenging and, and that can emerge into like terrible things, anti-vaxxers, you know, conspiracy theories, all, all of those. You know, like somehow we might have to try to share our knowledge with those people, you know, just, you know, pick up a paintbrush, you know, pick up a camera, make some art, you know, think, think these things through in a way that's not cruel and mean, you know. Sometimes we can be quite cruel and mean in our art. But, but yeah, you, you know, like it, it can be like a productive and fun journey that you go on with your friends and your peers and your family to, to make art and have these conversations. And, and you're not alone in these moments of chaos and disparity. Like it, the world is always a difficult place to exist in, you know, and, and art helps it a little bit for me. Nikki? Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, I think everything that you've just said and, and also, um, you know, I think it's really important also to acknowledge that um, art doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like we don't, you know, we we are working within the context of, of you know, previous generations work um, as well. Like every generation has, has their own battle to fight and we're all kind of part of the same same story. Um, and I think that's really important to remember as well because sometimes it, it does kind of feel, when it feels really difficult, it does kind of feel like, oh, you know, like, why am I doing this? But like you said, you know, incredibly privileged to be here and making art and being given the platform and 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 to be able to um, be surrounded by, you know, so many incredible people who are so willing and generous in, in the conversation and participate as well. Um, I think that hope is, um, for me personally, it, it's a word that it's like um, I have a complicated relationship with because um, I think hope can be can seem overly optimistic and and um, actually in your bio, <laughs> like um, that Carolyn was um, was uh, reading out earlier, that um, you know diaspora is melancholy. Like there is so much melancholy in being in diaspora and I think that that will always be there and that's part of the, the experience as well. Um, and I don't know if they inform each other um, or if they pull from each other, but um, that's the space that, that I'm uh, quite grateful for, I guess. John? <laughs> Would you like to respond? But I mean, I, I think it like that, that idea of melancholy but I mean, I suppose like with your work in particular, it's the clarity that you bring whilst pulling many things together. And, you know, to have, I mean, particularly the, you know, the, the um, you know, the history paintings that just, you know, just the weight of history and the weight of loss and the weight of people's experiences that you encapsulate by this, you know, this layering and all the elements bringing together. I mean, I'm, that's why I'm saying it's it's a gift. Like, you've spent time going through all that, putting all that together, um, dedicating your life to it, putting it out there. Um, it, it's it's incredible. Uh, when I, I think when we were describing my me melancholy, yes, it, it was related to, to diaspora and memory, but, but, but it was actually... Uh, it was a bit more than that in the sense that uh, uh, it's it's actually a melancholy of uh, you know losing the sense of the human uh, through technology um, and that, that that that's that sense of the human uh, that we have in relationship to uh, memory and 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 uh, uh, things like um, you know benevolence and uh, all these, all these things that that were human values is being lost through, through um, AI and through you know technology and and the post-human situation. And I and I feel that this is the, this is a melancholy that I felt deeply uh, in the 90s and and in the early two, 2000s thousands uh, with the oncoming of you know, um, the digital world. But now I really feel uh, I, I'm quite actively feeling that I have to rescue from a, for myself, if not for anything else, uh, a lot of the ethical values that are being eroded uh, through technology and, and through the post-human condition. And so, so I'm sort of like becoming a bit of an old-time humanist 
I mean, not totally. Not like the French type, but like, you know, <laughs> you know, like there, there are remnants of these sort of values that I feel uh, I need to um, be a little bit more than just melancholic. So hence the commitment to painting, a commitment and to, drawing, to, to, to 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 recreating, and reimagining narratives that that had those sort of values, which I'm still learning about. So um, I think maybe it's time now to hand over to the audience to ask some questions. So apparently I have to give my microphone over because you're going to ask the questions, and John, James, and Nikki are going to answer. <laughs> anyone has any questions just pop your hand up and I'll come over with the microphone we are recording today's session so I'm keen to get microphones to people thank you um, it's not a Dorothy Dixer but um, just as you're talking about Malacone at the end it's more of a comment than a question I was thinking about Ocean Vong's writings um, and him being a diasporic writer rather than um, an, a, a visual artist. Um, so I, I don't know if any of you would like to discuss his work in relation to your positions. Um, but also going back to the question that you asked John before about has the, has, have things changed? I was wondering if you want to comment on 4A and the position of Asian Australian artists in Australia when you uh, established 4A in the mid early to mid 90s, I think it was, and um, the the reasons it was established and how its mission has changed and and what Nikki and James think about um, its mission now. Okay, um, so I think Forays was started in 1996 and uh, it, it started in Sydney uh, and it was called uh, um, Forays, <laughs> Asian Australian Artists Association. And basically it was not like an artist club. How it started was actually um, uh, trying to encourage um, Asian patronage because I felt that so many Asian people with lots of dough was playing golf uh, and uh, wasn't giving much to the uh, wasn't giving much to the cultural field. So I thought maybe you know we can give this a try. Uh, this is all be before the days when uh, art was sexy in Hong Kong, you know, for example. So so basically we were hoping that uh, because people in A Asian people generally were financially rich but culturally still extremely underdeveloped and not as so much poor, but you know, like it, it, the voice is still very, very uh, slight in Australia. And so we, we tried to do that, but you know, I found that there were no Asians that were actually helped us. All the people that helped us and donated were actually Australians. <laughs> what? Um, not until lately. Um, so, so anyway, that, that development uh, sort of morphed into uh, a, a place where we created a few super curators like Melissa Chu and Aaron Sito and, and, and now Michaela Tai, who's now the head of the Visual Arts Board, uh, the Australia Council for Visual Arts. And, and um, you know, in that sense, Curiously enough, it just became a thing that trained people to to have institutional power rather than really uh, a, f a, a cauldron for you know cultural renaissance, so to speak. You know, so uh, it has changed, and also the focus now is not so much East Asia. Uh, it has changed towards uh, West Asia, towards Iran and Pakistan and places like that. So um, my focus is not so good with, with those areas. You know, like really we need to pass it on to someone else to deal with and take care of, which we have. Um, so in that sense, it, it's, a, um, it's a very interesting development from the days when we started as wanting a voice for Asian artists to a point now, which is that people are allowed to sort of have a voice 
but how do you sort of articulate this vast footprint and and also um, with the quality of art that is produced rather than just the early days of just creating curators that has the power to change the situation. Questions from others? I'll just say I'm glad I'm not a HSC student. <laughs> <laughs> I bought the book but never read it. <laughs> what is it about? <laughs> Michelle. Yeah, so, so I think um, Ocean Vung's book was in the HSC. Was it a surprise text or was it one they already studied? It's. I've got the mic now. <laughs> Um, thanks to, to all of you, all three, four of you, in fact, um, given me lots to think about. Um, I actually was going to ask a similar question to Kate's about 4A, and, um, but, but I specifically, uh, I guess, wanted to draw out um, the generational, uh, I suppose, distinction and or connection that... I was hearing, um, I guess, from yourself, John, when you were asking Nikki about her own curatorial interests and um, I guess you framed it in terms of cap cultural capital, um, but I guess if to use another word, I guess we can think of that as a kind of empowerment um, in order to be able to um, curate a certain kind of politics. Um, a political position. I'm not sure if that's quite right, <laughs> Nikki. Um, but but uh, it did strike me that there was something quite similar, in fact, with what 4A was doing at the time. And just hearing you comment on that, John. Um, now, I I guess I I, I heard a curatorial kind of. Um, authority there also, uh, 4A, when it started. Um, but I sensed, and of course I wasn't, you know, actually there in, in, in the making of 4A to witness it, um, but I, I sensed that there was also a strong artist, you know, um, interest in that space of empowerment for, you know, a particular cultural community of you know, Asian di diaspora artists. And, uh, would it be right to be, be reading that connection um, between the generations here? Because, yeah, or, or do you see more difference between what, say, Nikki's, Nikki's doing in, in this generation and what 4A was doing when it started? I think, I think sorry, Nikki, I just want to, you know, su suggest that uh, actually 4A was quite lucky when it started then, because it, it, it dovetailed at the same time as the rise of contemporary, sexy Chinese contemporary art at one point, you know. And so that, that really gave it a sort of momentum and interest, uh, or, you know, without people really ultimately questioning uh, the standing of forays in Australia. It was just sexy to be interested in Chinese contemporary art. And I think that that, that, that really gave it that sort of catapult, in a sense. But, you know, after that, I ag do agree that, that there has been a, a lot of changes in terms of, I mean, Nikki, you'd be able to enlighten us on this, you know, the, this, this perception of yourself as an artist within, within this milieu is, is very different. Right? Um, yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks, Michelle. Um, and, and also, it's so interesting because, I mean, the first exhibition um, that Havana Net Projects um, made, which wasn't like Have Projects Projects um, actually came after that, but um, it was co-curated by um, Tammy Wong Holbert and, and, and Fung. Um, it was called Have <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, it's, it's very confusing. Um, but they, they actually, you know, they curated that show because um, they were like, yeah, there's no 4A in Melbourne. So, you know, 4A has a legacy that, that um, like, you know, just no doubt that we have um, 
you know, been thinking about so much of what 4A did to a generation of Asian artists, um, you know, in the 90s and in the 2000s, I think is sort of, um, we're trying to do something um, similar in a different climate and within a different um, landscape, I guess. Um, we also are incredibly lucky, I think, um, because um, both Fung and myself are currently um, supported by a PhD scholarship, so we are you know, we can um, spend a lot of time um, on, on this um, with the very limited resources that's available to us. Um, and we've also got Asian patronage. <laughs> um, there's a house that, that we can use for free in Sunshine West um, where we can run artist residencies when we're not in a pandemic. Um, and yeah, so I think that it's definitely sort of like a generational, um, so connection there, um, it's very different climates. I think that's why the forms and the outcomes and, 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 and the community kind of feels a little bit different. Yeah. Questions from others? I'm conscious we're running a little behind time, so maybe one more. Hooray. Perhaps this might be the end. Um, uh, Nikki, uh, you talked about John's reference to melancholy, but you also talked about hope and and um, in relation to diaspora. I just think they're very powerful ideas. I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit. Oh. <laughs> um, how much time do we have? Um, uh, how do I put this? I, I guess it, it comes from a pretty personal um, personal perspective because um, I, uh, I've spent half my life in Hong Kong and half my life here um, and um, with everything that has been happening to Hong Kong in the last few years um, and, and you know uh, scholars have written about Hong Kong before about like it's, it's politics of disappearance as constantly sort of just uh, slipping away from you. Um, and my entire family's there. So pandemic, you know, border closures, <laughs> like all those things that's just been, um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty depressing. Um, I think that this idea of kind of um, uh, being very far away from um, your roots, I suppose, um, is it's one that is like both quite liberating, but also, terribly, t like, oh, sorry, terrifying at the same time. Um, I think it has taken me a personally a very, very long time to understand what that, what that tension actually is for me. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm in a privileged position to um, have the, um, you know, have the, the resources it means to stay and, and, and to, um, you know, have the agency to, to kind of make that choice. But I think that um, melancholy um, is something that potentially exists in, in a lot of um, diasporic experiences where, you know, you're constantly just um, having to negotiate that, that relationship with the past um, and with your family and, and also trying to make um, space for yourself so that you can um, live with hope, I suppose. Thank you. So it seems like we've got to the end of the panel. So um, I'd really like to thank John, James and Nikki for their contribution. And um, I hope everyone's had a chance to have a look at John's fantastic exhibition because the effort in getting all that work together and the beautiful gallery and the way it's installed are, are, quite, are quite phenomenal. And I'd also like to thank Bunjil Place because I think a lot of the... Um, you know, the, the issues that we've been raised today, um, really the diversity of work that you show and for it to be shown here is really fantastic. Um, so thanks very much, everyone. Thank you very much, audience.